we're having a in-depth look at uh, some of the issues that have happened this year, particularly around bushfires at the start of the year, and also around the the COVID sort of crisis and how that's impact on engagement and uh, managing projects in that environment. So without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to Anne and uh, we can get started uh, on a topic I think most people will have uh, quite a bit of interest in. And thanks, Jeff, for the introduction. Yeah, I, I think crisis project management is something that we've all probably learned a little bit about this year. Um, for those that don't know me, um, I'm Ian Laslett. I'm a director in EY's Digital and Emerging Technology. And I was formerly managing director of Adelphi Digital, um, and we did a lot of work um, in the Drupal space, but also in the, the kind of web project space um, with a huge range of organisations. And today, I guess I want to, to focus a little bit on um, some, some interesting case studies and anecdotes and, and some advice, I think, around what, what to do and how to manage projects during a crisis. Um, as a starting point, um, at any given time, we support a huge range of, of clients. Um, and this is just a quick one that's particularly relevant this year. Um, during the bushfire crisis last year, we were supporting both the ACT and New South Wales Emergency Services. Um, we're currently supporting Emergency Management Victoria. Um, during coronavirus, we were supporting Smart Traveller um, and we built and managed that site. Um, we also look after a whole range of Department of Home Affairs sites. Um, ACT Health, um, we've been working with them on their um, coronaviruses sites and, and the, the general public information from ACT Health over this period. And also things like TransLink, we, you know, transport in Brisbane, things like that. Um, there's a huge, I guess, depth of knowledge and experience that we've got from, from these kinds of clients. And I thought I'd share some of that with you today. Um, for those that live in Canberra, um, these red and, and yellow emergency warnings might, might bring back some horrible memories. Um, earlier in the year um, and during the fire crisis last year, um, I wanted to, to, I guess, talk through a couple of examples of what happened and, and how to manage during the crisis. Um, the first um, red emergency warning you, there, you see there is for a, a fire that occurred on the 22nd of January last, uh, this year, sorry, um, over at Beard and Oaks Estate, which is just over near the airport here in Canberra. Um, what was really interesting about this one was the fire itself obviously was very quick and, and happened um, really, really fast, but it was also a day where AWS was having a huge amount of issues with their instances, um, caused a lot of outages around the country for some very big and notable organisations. Um, so there were some dramas around how you manage your infrastructure, how you manage your hosting and support while an emergency situation is going on. Um, and some lessons learned in, in that one. And the second, I guess, one I wanted to talk about a little bit was around the uh, Aurora Valley fire, which was one of the really, really big fires that occurred um, in the week after that actually and burned for many, many weeks later. Um, and I think talking about those two two fires and, and the, the context around how you manage during that period is, is the background for, for the talk today. Um, I think, there's a few things I wanted to talk through. Um, preparation is obviously key. It's really important to understand how to prepare, what you're doing, um, what to do during a crisis, how to manage um, both your technical your users, um, stakeholder engagement, everything that's going on during a crisis. Um, what happens when your crisis continues? I mean, this year we've had crises that have lasted all year. You know, the coronavirus crisis has effectively gone on for the whole year. Um, what does that mean for your teams? What does that mean for your users? Um, and I guess I'll sum up with some, some lessons learned arising out of that um, as well. So um, let's, let's just focus on theme one for a second, which is around preparation. And I've got um, a few points on each, um, each particular area to focus on. I think I always start, and I think it is very important to start with knowing your users. Um, for all these emergency sites and for any actual site or anything that you manage, I think you need to know your load and traffic profile. Um, you need to know in detail what the performance and load of your site is expected to be. Um, then triple it. I mean, some of these sites that, that normally get a few hundred users a day were in the tens or hundreds of thousands of users um, a day. And I think the Smart Traveller site at one point was uh, on the day that the travel restrictions were announced um, for um, that Australians weren't recommended to go overseas. It was something like 2 million people visited the site or something on that particular day from all around the world. 
um, you know, far beyond the expectations of what originally the site had been scaled and designed for, um, yet we were able to deal with those situations and kind of grow and scale to what we did. Um, one really interesting story, and I think that's important to note, is like we, we do load testing and performance testing on all the sites that we build, but um, something that isn't always immediately apparent is the user journeys that people will take during, during a crisis. So if you're, for instance, running one of those fire sites, people don't want to go to the homepage. They'll just go and hit the fire page and refresh it constantly. You know, you might have, you might be expecting that, you know, you'll get, you know, and we actually expected that the whole population of Canberra would hit the emergency services site um, over that period. What we didn't expect was that every single managed dog would go on and refresh that page every 10 seconds just to see if there was another update. Um, so when you're doing your load and, and performance and, and really understanding that, you need to understand what the what's really going to happen in terms of the crisis and really plan for that. And it's far beyond what you expect. Um, the other thing to think about is what is your support model in advance? You know, are you going to fully staff during a crisis? Are you going to have people there in the middle of the night sitting, um, making sure everything's up or not? Are you going to have people on call? Um, in the I guess in the in the technical space, it's much easier to run a kind of on call um, support centre but that may not be sufficient during a crisis. Um, and that's one thing I think we've worked closely with some of the emergency services around is, you know, how do you upscale a team from what during the rest of the year might have a couple of people running some support during the week, and then all of a sudden during a crisis, you need you know, 20, 30, 40 people potentially available to support this thing, to publish content, to manage issues, to get back to people and all kinds of stuff. So you need to have that planned and ready in advance. Um, the main aim from a user point of view is to reduce risk. So you want to get information out that reduces people's risk during a crisis, um, and get them information that helps them in their area. Um, internally, I do want to talk a little bit about the, the process and how you run and manage your people. Um, you, you need to know how you're going to deal and, and communicate and publish and everything during a crisis. Um, you know, and you need to have test those processes and procedures um, a lot of these things can be alleviated by preparing in advance. So if you're going to be publishing content, um, you know, you can prepare pro formers, you can have um, your content kind of ready to go and all you do is populate it with the information that's current at that time and things like that. Um, one of the big sticking points around all these um, potential emergency sites is who approves content and how does it actually get out there? Um, you know, there's a there's almost a hesitancy sometimes in, in some places to publish and release information, but users want that information out there as quickly as possible. So you need to have decided in advance how you're going to manage and, and release that content and get things out there. Um, one really interesting thing is as well, if you've designed your architecture in a high availability way, how do you get content out and how do you publish it as quickly as possible? It's not always, if you've put a lot of caching in front of your site, if you put a CDN in there, if you've got web application firewalls, if you've got caching in your database, if you've got everything through there, it may actually take minutes or longer to get content live. Um, in an emergency situation, that may not be appropriate. So you need to have thought that all through and really understood how you're going to publish and get content live as quickly as possible. Um, leading on from that, I guess you need to design your system and architecture to support that. Um, in advance, testing your disaster recovery, testing your failover, make sure you've done all that. Um, Back to the, I guess, the beard fire and the initial um, stages of, a, of an AWS outage around that. We had um, multiple availability zones in AWS set up for the, the site we were running at the time. Um, but when the whole provider starts going down, what do you do at that point? Do you have a disaster recovery plan in place for that? Um, how do you set that up? Have you tested it in advance? Um, and this is one thing that, that I think became immediately apparent that, you know, and you can't, rely just on one data center provider for an emergency situation. You really need multiple data centers. Um, and Drupal itself is not particularly great at dealing with that. Um, it's not really set up in a way where you can have different data centers with different masters publishing content or anything like that. It's actually a really hard technical problem to work out um, on how you do that. So if you've got, say, your AWS instance is primary and then you've got some Azure and you've got something else in there as well, how do you, you can direct traffic to those things easy enough, but how do you then switch it to publishing content and things is actually a real challenge that, that Drupal hasn't yet solved, I guess, overall as a, as a way of doing that. Um, the other thing to think about is, is in terms of your preparation is um, what to do with your social um, and video content. You know, there's not just your website, although that was the primary source of truth for most of these things. People are publishing them constantly on Twitter, constantly on Facebook. You're getting a lot of feedback through those channels and things as well. Um, 
you need to know where those channels are, how you're going to be managing the content that comes through to them, and you need to set up and test and monitor everything around it as well. Um, so that's all the things I think, and a lot of the things you can do in preparation for a, for a crisis, and then you can go from there. So what actually happens during a crisis? Um, yeah, it's, it's a real, um, I think at any point when one of these fires or one of these things happen, um, you know, this was less than 24 hours later uh, from the initial release of the Aurora Valley fire that, you know, significant areas were under emergency warning. Um, there was a huge, almost panic in the Canberra community at the time around this because the fire was effectively about 10 kilometres out down the bottom of Tuggeranong um, and very, very close to, to homes and things. Um, but what does that actually mean in terms of the technical support um, and project management point of view during that period? What were we doing to help with the crisis and what could you be doing to help, I guess, if you were running in a similar situation? Um, I think, once again, it goes back to the users. Like, at that point, what users really want is timely local information. Um, they don't want to be in a situation where they're um, waiting to find out about them. Um, they also don't want information that's not relevant to them. Um, you see a lot of situations where people are publishing, like in the national news articles, might be talking about fires all around the country. That kind of stuff becomes irrelevant to people at that point. What they really want is their real local information about what's going on in their suburb. Are they in danger? Do they need to evacuate? Do they need to move something on um, in their own area? And I don't think... Um, I know we haven't done a great job at this, and I don't think many organisations have yet, is how do you personalise and localise your content in that way? How do you get it out to users at a real suburb by suburb level to tell them what they need to do at that situation? So I think it's something as a, a challenge for the, the project management and digital people you know, around here is thinking about that and pushing that content out um, to a localised level is something that I think we'd really see from the emergency services and, and other, other support services in the next little while. Um, one thing that also happened a lot during the crisis is you got a huge amount of feedback. Like we were getting feedback through all the social channels. Um, you're getting lots and lots of um, people with strange technology issues. You know, I'm running IE version six and my map won't load. It doesn't mean I have to evacuate and things. Like how you need to be kind of ready to deal with that and jump into it. Um, the other thing that happens a little bit is that there's a, a pressure to change things. You know, in that situation where there's an issue with your old browser, um, do you, do you try and pump out a, a fix for it? And I think the, the strong advice from myself is no. I mean, you, you, you've got a site that might be serving hundreds of thousands of people at that time. What you don't want to be doing is releasing a new code or trying to fix a particular bug that's affecting a tiny proportion of the users. So you need, but there is a lot of pressure. You know, people, you know, executives will be calling up saying, oh, there's people having this drama, can we fix it? And the answer is, well, we can fix it, but I don't think you should be fixing it at that moment if it's not affecting the base, um, the huge number of users out there. Um, I think during the crisis, grabbing the team, really owning what's going on. Um, I've got some points here that talk about sharing um, a shared space. Um, the emergency services and all of them run this way where they, they gather people together in a physical location and the guys are doing emergency services ACT are out at Fairburn there. And it actually was great. We got out there with our, our support guys, the infrastructure support guys, um, the publishing team, and everyone was co-located there during the, the fire crisis. And... Um, it was actually faster to solve issues there in the room than it would have been over Teams or setting up a call or whatever else happens. So I know everyone loves virtual communication and we're all here today speaking virtually, but it was super important to be in the same room with each other um, and jump in there. If you did need people to dial in, the other tip I've got there is um, use a consistent calling mechanism. Everyone wants to use something different. Everyone says, oh, I'll just set it up on my Teams or I'll run my Zoom meeting and everything and then you get dramas. Just set one up at the start of the, the crisis and say, this is what we're using, ongoing. Everyone just use that. Um, and don't forget the emotional strain. Like during a crisis, some people don't react well. Some people get very worried about their own property or their own families. Um, obviously, it's important to let people, um, if they can, um, not have to deal with the crisis situation in, in, the, in the work sense as well. If they need to go and do something with their families, you need to be able to deal with that as well. Um, Develop a second team. Make sure that you've got two people working on things. Develop um, lots and lots of um, collaborative ways for those guys to work that aren't impacted by the actual crisis that's going on. Um, with the aid, with the beard fire where the AWS instances were going down, we stood up a second team that went off and developed a, a microsite within a few hours that was ready to be launched and we we're in the process of switching the DNS over to that site through a separate data centre um, during a second team during that period. I think that's a really 
crucial thing that that team wasn't dealing with the core issues. They were completely removed from that and had their own priorities and things to deal with. And I think that's a great way to deal with um, prices, crises and issues. If you've got lots of those, then set up lots and lots of different teams and get lots of people out there doing that stuff. Um, keep scaling your tech. Um, you know, it's really nice these days the way you can scale your infrastructure. Um, you know, at one point, I think in, during the, the worst of the fire season, we'd gone from a couple of production um, EC2 instances up to so 20 or 30, um, you know, large instances at AWS. Um, and we we're able to scale and grow that capacity as required, um, scale the databases and things like that. Um, as I said before, develop multi-zone um, and multi-cloud providers is super important. And keep monitoring during your technology over that whole period. Um, we had guys sat there on the infrastructure watching what was going on in the databases um, and things like that. Crisis can last for a long, long time. Um, that fire in Aurora Valley lasted for weeks. Um, this is just a few days later. It was back to advice, and it stayed advice for quite a long time, but there was still a lot of people interested in what was going on. Um, what becomes even more important then is, I guess, once again, time and local content for users. Um, if it's not impacting them, they're not really interested, but you need to be able to keep serving that content out um, and maintain connectivity with those users. Um, there's also a lot of questions around cross-border jurisdictional things at that time. Um, the users didn't care about that. They just wanted to know the information that was current for them. So um, make sure you keep that in mind um, if you are in government and dealing with cross-border things. The users do not care who, who they're talking to. They just want all the information relevant to them. Um, keep motivating your team. Make sure that everyone's uh, on board. Um, you have to bring and, and rotate your team through a crisis. It's very difficult just to have everyone working through um, days and days of a crisis situation. You want to have lots of people being able to be drawn in and, and, and deal with it. Um, crisis fatigue becomes a real issue. And I think we've seen during coronavirus this year, you know, with Victoria running, say, 100 press conferences in a row, I can't imagine the stress that those guys were under during that period to continually do that. It becomes a real issue over an extended crisis of how you keep people focused on the job um, and things. And I think rotation, motivation, um, um, incentives and things are, are great ways to do that. And make sure you're planning and um, your major announcements and things as much as possible. Keep running your second team during a crisis. Over an extended period, you can have lots of good work being done that's not been impacted by the crisis itself. Um, while the emergency services stuff was going on, um, we actually developed a whole um, different way of publishing and managing content through this dark site process, where, which will focus only purely on a crisis. Um, so instead of having a normal site, you'll just have a crisis site and be able to do that. And we were developing that in parallel while the main crisis was going on. Um, and also testing and managing everything in parallel too. Um, and nearly there, but I think you can automate a lot of this stuff as well. Um, you can automate your deployments, obviously automate your testing. There's a lot of tools out there and there's some other really interesting talks today about how you might manage that. Um, one big gotcha, um, equipment costs can become huge. If you're in a crisis and you scaled up your servers because you're meeting a particular demand and you're a budgeting person in the, in the public service, your infrastructure cost can go from you know a few thousand dollars to tens of thousands of dollars a day very very quickly, and, and that becomes a massive cost um, for everyone. Um, make sure you keep testing your DR processes because things change over time. And last but not least, go back and revisit it all. Um, we had so much feedback during some of these processes, and it actually took us a long time to go back and, and gather all the feedback and, and work through it. And we spent the last few months improving things for this fire season, so that things should be much more smooth for this year. And that's about it. So thanks, guys. Happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank, thanks for that, Ian. Um, I'm just checking on there. There's there's no questions showing up. So if anyone wants to put anyone in there now or to catch up with Ian a bit later throughout the day. Um, I guess I was just going to say, Ian, that was a good point in terms of that sort of fatigue because obviously a lot of people here in Canberra had visions of 2003 when big fires hit the city again when that happened. So, and and obviously people with working on the project whose own homes might have been threatened by these as well. So I guess that's a real challenge in balancing that need yeah. and trying to. I guess the other thing about co-locating stuff as well and how important that was. That like, that was a pretty important one I saw on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, co-location was was. Super helpful, I think, and I'd really recommend that as a way to, to get people together and work through these issues. Even though it's harder in COVID times, I think you can be COVID safe and, and get that done. Yeah. All right. Um, 
Well, that's about all for now. I think we're on to the next session shortly. So thanks very much again, Ian, for that. Um, that was a really interesting and, and relevant talk given all that's been going on. So thanks very much. Thanks, guys.